Welcome to the course Introduction to Urban Planning. In today's session, we will cover Land Acquisition Act. In the previous class, we did touch upon it while studying the timeline of different acts. Land Acquisition Act has been subject of debate. So, in this class, we will follow the act as a document and also simultaneously look at the reviews to understand the debate around it. So, accordingly our coverage will include first we will understand issues of land and then we will look into why government need to acquire land. The concept of eminent domain, we will try to learn about it. Then we will look at the right to property as per our constitution, then we will look at the history of land acquisition, then we will look at the rights to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act of 2013 in detail to certain extent. In this we will look at its application, purpose, key definitions, cost of acquisition, social impact assessment, food security safeguard, rehabilitation and resettlement provision. We will look at some of the formats, reviews and the following ordinance with it. So, accordingly the learning outcome expected will be you should be able to discuss the issue of land, you should be able to review the government's needs to acquire land, you should be able to define the concept of eminent domain, you should be able to state the right to property as per our constitution. You should be able to synthesize the history of land acquisition. Further, you should be able to identify and review key elements of the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act of 2013 and look into various application purpose, key definitions and so on. Moving on, we are all familiar with the value of land and let us try to understand the impact of land acquisition from the perspective of land owners first. As quoted by Professor Daniel in publication of 2016 and he quotes from Sharon O'Brien American Indian Tribal Governments document. The quote reads, our land is more valuable than your money. It will last forever, it will not even perish by the flames of fire. As long as the sun shines and the waters flow, this land will be here to give life to men and animals. Compulsory acquisition of land not only leads to loss of economic assets and livelihood, but also disrupts communities, cultural identities, local markets for goods and labors, consequently placing the austies in a spiral of impoverishment. Here in the quote, we see why land is considered valuable. Further in the court, we see that the compulsory acquisition of land leads to loss of economic assets and livelihood, but also disrupts communities, cultural identities, local markets for goods and labor. Therefore, according to the court, compulsory land acquisition leads to austies, which are especially one who are removed from his or her place of residence or land to make room for an infrastructure improvement or public work project and this leads them to the spiral of impoverishment meaning the loop of poverty. Let us see why land is acquired by the government. Looking at the Indian landscape, we see most of the land is under agriculture and is occupied. The government in order to take the developmental work like construction of roads, industries, universities, dams, flyovers, bridges, housing, mines and so on requires vast expanses of land. 
Since land is a limited resource, in order to carry out development work, the government has to acquire land, thereby depriving the existing occupants from its use. This leads to large scale displacement and forced transfer of people from their land. Development is important and so is due process for land acquisition and compensation and resettlement all these are important aspect. Furthermore, we also see that government acquired land for private parties. Trying to understand why does the government need to acquire land for private companies as well as public private partnership projects. As per the writings of Verma, we see one reason given is to ensure benefits for livelihood users. If land is purchased, then there are no benefits for livelihood losers, people who lose livelihood because of the transaction of the land, who are usually far greater in number than the actual land owners. This bill ensures that they are taken care of and not simply displaced. Another explanation includes safeguarding the farmers. We see that inequality in terms of bargaining power exists between large scale corporations and small farmers, which increases the likelihood of unfair agreement. That is why the government is required to bridge the gap and bring balance to this relationship. Further author explains, we need this intervention for building public infrastructure. We see that a legitimate need is there for acquisition by the state itself to build public goods such as roads, schools and hospitals and this can be undermined and stalled by group with vested interests. So, this can be hindered. So, that is why government needs to come to intervene. If there is no sovereign power to compel these groups, a single individual or group of individuals can hold a process uh, merely by refusing to part with the land. We also look at what does the term eminent domain means. Eminent domain as we see from the United States document as per the fifth amendment to the US constitution, it forbids the taking of private property for public use without just compensation. The authority of federal state and the local governments to take private property for public use providing just compensation to the owner is called eminent domain. Real estate or land is not only property subject to eminent domain law, but water and air rights as well. To explore this concept consider the following eminent domain definition. Now, looking at the right to property of the Indian citizen. I would like to remind you that in our country, right to property is not a fundamental right, but a constitutional right under the article of 300A of the constitution. During the first decade of independence era, it was felt that the right to property as a fundamental right was a great obstruction for socio-economic development which was seen as a source of conflict when state was to acquire private property for public purposes, particularly to expand the rail network, road network and industries and so on. So, in order to resolve this hurdle, this obstruction, the Supreme Court in this uh, in the historic case known as fundamental rights case held that the right to property is no part of the basic structure of the constitution and therefore, parliament can acquire or take away private property of a person, persons for concerned good and in the public interest. Thereafter, parliament passed the constitution 44th amendment which made right to property an ordinary legal right under article 300A. So, property right, life of people displayed, the need for the nation to industrialize and provide infrastructure for good of the larger population have put land acquisition at core of discussion and debate. Now, looking at the history of Land Acquisition Act, as Professor Daniels review in 2016, the history of land acquisition began with the 
Bengal Regulation 1 of 1824 to promote British commercial interest. Land for construction of railways was acquired under the Land Acquisition Regulation and finally the first railway came up. The Bengal Regulation 1 of 1824 was replaced by Act 1 of 1850 by which the provision of for land acquisition was extended to Kolkata town. By 1857 various laws on land acquisitions were consolidated as Act 6 of 1857 and it was made applicable to the whole of British India. The 1857 Act was replaced by the Land Acquisition Act 10 of 1870. We further see that uh, Venkat Anand uh, review in 2015 indicates that the 1870 law brought a mechanism for settlement for the first time. So, in this particular law we see the mechanism came in. It was eventually replaced by the Land Acquisition Act of 1894. The 1894 law did not apply to princely states like Hyderabad, Mysore, Travancore who enacted their own land acquisition le legislation. Briefly looking at the Land Acquisition Act of 1894 because this was an important act. As per Professor Daniel's review, the act was enacted by British with the definite objective of building infrastructure like railways, post telegraph lines, roads, bridges, canals, communication network and means to transfer their army and weaponry to different parts of the country. Their basic intention was to extend control and further consolidate their rule throughout the country. Hence, land belonging to the rural land owners was acquired under the act. The ownership and control of the infrastructure and the communication network built after the land acquisition remained completely with the government for utilization and public purpose. Continuing from Professor Daniel's writing, we see that after independence the process of acquisition of land from farmers for building steel plants, fertilizer plants, defense related plants and dams continued all for public purposes. Thereafter the government entered into housing, urban development and industrial sector and resorted to acquisition of land from farmers for developing housing colonies, laying electrical poles and industries. All these activities were for the public purposes. After the liberalization of economy as you may recollect from a series of discussion, this led to privatization. We see that the share of private initiatives in various sectors increased and the private sector started taking the responsibilities which were earlier discharged by the government in return for number of incentives from the government side. Looking into the drawback of the Land Acquisition Act of 1894, we see that as per the uh, review by Daniel's writing, we see that in the past years large scale acquisition of land has been made for companies under part 7 of 1894 act proposing to use the land for a public purpose. We see that the state government have acquired large tracts of land in rural areas belonging to farmers, rural landowners at low prices in the name of development projects. Later after changing the land use, land was handed over to private builders of, for construction of multi-storied residential and commercial complexes, industries and so on. So, Professor, Daniels, Professor Daniel points out that there have been cases where the landowners, farmers were assured of employment generation for their known or in relation but did not happen. So, this did not happen as they were neither skilled for the job nor qualified for the same. There are reported narrations of farmers being cheated in the name of land acquisition for public purpose as they do not get the market price for the land due to the underrated sale deeds and the government uh, uh, said to be 
playing the agent for the private players. So as per his report, we see such kind of narrations coming in. Further, uh, we see Daniel's, uh, Daniel makes observation that even if the landowners or farmers receive compensation for the government, it does not provide any monetary benefit to them as the money received as is either wasted or spent unwisely. So you may have noticed about or read about such kind of things where people got money but they wasted the money or lost the money. So uh, we see that there is no agency to counsel these farmers, landowners for proper use for long term investment or management of the money. Many other reviews also indicate that the forcible and excessive acquisition of land in the name of development had destroyed number of families and pushed backward communities further into the margins of poverty. We see that the methods of acquiring land under the Dated Land Acquisition Act of 1894 was considered very harsh as observed by many researchers because of the forced nature of acquisition combined with unreasonably low rates of compensation and vested too much arbitrary authority in the state agencies. So as per the reviews, the act fails to address some important issues associated with land acquisition, particularly forcible acquisition. Forced acquisitions meaning that under the 1894 legislation, once the acquiring authority has formed the intention to acquire a particular plot of land, it can carry out the acquisition regardless of how the person whose land is sought to be acquired is affected. So nevertheless, the land would be taken. We further see uh, there were limitation with the definition of public purpose and then there were reported case of very low rate of compensation. Low rate of compensation like as per the Supreme Court observation, it noted that the act has become outdated and needs to be replaced at earliest by fair reasonable and rational enactment in tune by the constitutional provisions, particularly Article 300A of the Constitution deals with persons not to be deprived of the property save by the authority of law. Then researchers also point out widespread misuse of the urgency clause. Urgency clause, this is the most criticized section of the law. Uh, of this particular law. The clause never truly defines what constitutes an urgent need and leaves it to the discretion of the acquiring authority. As a result, almost all acquisitions under the act invoke the urgency clause. This results in the complete dispossession of the land without even the token satisfaction of the processes listed under the act. According to Professor Daniel's writing, the urgency clause is the most criticized and misused section of 1894 Act. The deliberate misuse of the section we see 175 by the state government is a serious cause for concern. This particular act 1894 has been referred to as a harsh law by many researchers because the landowners whose land is proposed to be acquired cannot seek ruling against it. Uh, he, she can only file objections under section 5A6 against the proposed land acquisition, which is a basic right to the landowner under the principle of natural justice or the alterem partem. As per the author, there have been number of cases where various state government have acquired land by misusing the provision of the section of the urgency clause under the provision the state government may direct the provision of section 5A shall not apply and take away the basic rights of the landowners to file his or her objections. Hence according to the author the state power is used to misuse the provision of urgency. We see a conflicted case of National Law University built in Nagri Ranchi, which came a lot in the news as per the research publication by Rahul Ranjan titled Unraveling the Narratives of Adivasi Dispossession, a case study of land acquisition in Nagri village, Jharkhand, 
published in 2018, the land primarily belonged to Adivasis was taken away to establish the National Law University. The conflict in Nagri surfaced on November 2011. Government of Jharkhand asserted eminent domain over 227 acres of fertile cultivated land under the emergency clause of Land Acquisition Act of 1894. The narratives of the displaced people indicated no compensation or absence of any alternative arrangement for the resettlement. The official narratives establishes that the land was transferred in 1957 and therefore the disputes seem valuable and immaterial. The land was acquired in 1957-58 for the construction of the Birsa Agriculture University and Seed Bank which was considered to be public purpose and according to the publication the case indicates a unique case of violation of the rights of the Adivasi based on the testimonies of the people mostly women who have been rendered landless and did not receive any compensation. The article also questioned the public purpose. Then the researchers also point out lack of transparency in the acquisition process, participation of communities whose land is being acquired, there was no safeguards, there was no real appeal mechanism to stop the process of acquisition in the act, there was no provision for rehabilitation and resettlement package. Reviewers also point out weak implementation and ineffective administration at the ground level increase the suffering and the pain of the people. Due to lack of clear definition of the public purpose, there has been considerable difference of opinion among various judgments of the Supreme Court, finally resulting into granting very broad discretionary powers to the state in terms of deciding the outlines of public purpose under particular circumstances. According to the uh, Professor Daniel's writing, the Act of 1894 did not provide any opportunity to land owners, persons having interest in land to raise objection against the acquisition of land. This further led to the amendment of 1894 Act in 1923 by which Section 5A was added under which any person interested in the land which was needed or likely to be needed for a public purpose or for a company could within 30 days from the date of publication of the notification under section 4 1 could file objection to the acquisition of the land plus under 5 a an opportunity of being heard was to be provided by the collector to the person interested in the land. By this amendment or the altrem partem which means is in Latin phrase meaning listen to the other side or let the other side be heard as well, which is the cardinal very important principle of natural justice which was incorporated into the process of acquisition under the act. After India gained independence in 1947, it adopted the Land Acquisition Act of 1894 by the Indian independence order in 1948. Since 1947 land acquisition in India has been through the British Era Act. It was in 1998 that the Rural Development Ministry initiated the actual process of amending the act. As per the Venkat Anand's writing, the 2007 bill called for a mandatory social impact assessment study in case of large scale physical displacement in the process of land acquisition. The act ensured the eligibility of tribals, forest dwellers and persons having tenancy rights under the relevant state laws as per the bill. While acquiring the land, the government had to pay for loss or damages caused to the land and standing crops in the process of acquisition and additionally the cost of resettlement and rehabilitation of affected persons or families. This cost or compensation would be determined by the intended use of the land and as per prevailing market prices. So it also sought to establish the land acquisition compensation disputes settlement authority at both the state and the central level for the purpose of providing speedy disposal of disputes relating to land acquisition compensation. 
Besides, the bill also proposed the, that land acquired as per the act which is unused for a period of 5 years shall be returned to the appropriate government. The bill of 2007 was reintroduced uh, in 2011 as the Land Acquisition Rehabilitation and Resettlement Bill of 2011. The bill was passed in August 2019 as the right to fair compensation and transparency in Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act in, of 2013 and came into effect on 1st January 2014. As per Venkat's writing later in May 2014, this act was amended to favor development driven agenda. It was argued that the government uh, found it difficult to execute its projects and programs which seeks to revive and boost domestic manufacturing. Under the proposed 2015 bill, there will be five categories which will be exempted from certain provisions of previous act uh, of 2013 including consent for acquisition. They are national security and defense production, rural infrastructure including electrification, affordable housing for the poor, industrial corridors and projects under public private partnership. So, where the land continues to vest with the central government. These categories are also exempted from the SIA social impact assessment provision as provided uh, for in 2013 act. 2013 act facilitated land acquisition by private companies which the 2015 bill has changed to private entities. So, we see that kind of restriction coming in. Further we see in uh, the 2015 version also removes restriction on the acquisition of land for private hospitals and private educational institutions. The Central Act of 2013 was brought to give effect to the pre-existing fundamental rights to livelihood of citizens. It ensured that livelihood will not be taken away unless it is in the public interest and that is seen by a social impact assessment. Uh, these things have to be ensured in the provision. Let us walk through the key provisions of, uh, uh, of the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act of 2013. The act states to ensure in consultation with institutions of local self government and Gram Sabhas established under the constitution a humane, participative, informed and transparent process for land acquisition for industrialization, development of essential infrastructure facilities and urbanization with the least disturbance to the owner of the land and other affected families and provide just and fair compensation to the affected families whose land has been acquired or proposed to be acquired or are affected by such acquisition and act makes adequate provision for the affected persons for their rehabilitation and resettlement for ensuring that the cumulative outcome of the compulsory acquisition should be that affected persons become partners in development leading to an improvement in their post acquisition social and economic status and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. Looking at the application of the act, now we will look at how where does the act apply. As per the act provision of this act concerns land acquisition, compensation, rehabilitation and resettlement when the appropriate government acquires land for its own use hold and control including for public sector undertakings and for public purpose. Looking at the purpose of the act, we see that uh, the act is applied for strategic purposes related to naval, military, air force, armed forces of the union including central paramilitary forces or any other vital to national security or defense of the country. Further we see it is used for the purpose of infrastructure projects under which all activities or items listed in the notification as per the government of India and uh, we see that infrastructure such as private hospitals, private educational institutions and private hotels are excluded, were excluded from this. 
however, which have been uh, amended after the ordinance of 2015. We see that uh, infrastructure projects such as involve, uh, projects involving agro-processing, further we see projects for industrial corridor or mining activities, national investment and manufacturing zones, they all come under infrastructure projects. Further we see projects for water harvesting and water conservation, structure, sanitation, for also we see project for government administer, administered, government aided educational and research schemes or institutions projects for sports, healthcare, tourism, transportation or space program. We also see any infrastructure facility as may be notified in this regard by the central government and after tabling of such notification in the parliament. Further, it also includes project for project affected families if something comes up and then also project for housing for specific income groups, also project for planned development or improvement of village sites also project for residential purpose to the poor or landless or to the person residing in areas affected by natural calamities. Moving on further we see that uh, land acquisition can be applied to following types of projects. One we see can be applied for public private partnership kind of projects. We see further it can be applied for private companies for public purpose provided that the process of obtaining the consent shall be carried out along the social impact assessment. We also see that it may apply in cases where a private company purchases land equal to or more than such limits in rural areas or urban areas. A private company requests the appropriate government for acquisition of a part of an area so prescribed for the public purpose. Now moving forward, we will look at some key definitions as given by the Act. These are not all which we cover here. For the detail, you can look into the Act. We only few, uh, pick up few selective definitions here. We see what does affected area means. Effective area, affected area means such areas as may be notified by the appropriate government. So the government notifies the affected area for the purpose of land acquisition. Further, we see affected family, which means family whose land or other immovable property has been acquired. Also, it may include a family which does not own any land. So, this is important to see that if even if the family does not own any land, but a member or a member of such family may be agricultural laborers, tenants, including any form of tenancy or holding of a suffrage right sharecroppers or artisan or may be working in the affected area for three years prior to the acquisition of the land whose primary source of livelihood stand affected by the land acquisition process. Further we see it includes the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers who have lost any of their forest rights recognized under the scheduled tribe and other traditional forest dwellers act. Also, it includes families whose primary source of livelihood for three years prior to the acquisition of the land is dependent on the forest or water bodies and includes gatherers of forest produce, hunters, fisher folk and boatmen and such livelihood which is affected because of this process here. A member of a family who has been assigned land by the state government or a central government under any of its scheme in such area. A family residing on any land in the urban areas for preceding three years or more prior to the acquisition of the land. So uh, moving forward, we see what constitute cost of acquisition. So what really comes the cost of acquiring a land? So the cost of acquisition includes amount of compensation which includes solar TM which means a thing given to someone as a compensation or consolation. Any enhanced compensation ordered by the land acquisition and rehabilitation and settlement authority or court and interest payable uh, at any other amount determined payable to the affected family. So that would constitute one component of uh, cost. We see the other component would be demarriage, a charge which is a charge payable to the owner of a chartered ship or on failure to load or discharge the ship within the time agreed. So whatever the loss or the damage has been happened because of not the fulfillment of the duties that is demarriage 
and that also has to be paid for the damages caused to the land and standing crop in the process of acquisition. It also includes cost of acquisition of land and the building for the settlement of the displaced. Uh, we also see the cost of development includes the infrastructure and the amenities at the settlement areas. Cost of rehabilitation and resettlement as determined in accordance with the provision of the act. So, that also is included. Further, it also includes the administrative cost, the cost which is uh, invested to take care of all these things. Further, we see it also includes the cost of undertaking social impact assessment. So, with all these uh, expenditure, it, uh, the real cost of uh, land acquisition comes in. Moving on, we see that the holding of land is defined as total land held by person as an owner occupant or tenant or otherwise. So, we see what, what land is, land also includes benefits to arise out of the land and things attached to the earth or permanently fastened to anything attached to the earth. We see uh, landless uh, is defined as such persons or class of persons who may be what uh, uh, as per the definition of the state or government whichever is applicable at that point in time. Further, we see uh, it defines land owners, people who have name recorded in the owning of the land or the building or any person who is guaranteed forest right under the scheduled tribe areas. Uh, further, who is entitled to be granted patta right on the land, any person who has been declared as such by an any order of court or authority. Further, we see it defines marginal farmers means a cultivator with an unirrigated land holdings up to 1 hectare or irrigated land holdings up to 1 half uh, hectare. It also defines persons interested. So, persons interested are all the persons claiming an interest in the compensation to be made on the account of acquisition of land under this act. The scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers who have lost an interest right recognized under the scheduled tribe and other traditional forest uh, dwellers act, they all come under persons interested. Uh, we also see persons interested in an easement easement if you look at the meaning of easement uh, means that a right to cross or otherwise use someone else's land for a specific purse purpose is also affected is also considered as the person interested. We see persons having tenancy rights under the relevant state law including sharecroppers by an, any other name uh, uh, there might be different name in different states. So, that may be included in this any person whose primary source of livelihood is likely to be adversely affected. So, uh, what does the project means? Uh, project means uh, uh, for which the land is being taken then the resettlement area means an area where the affected families who have been displaced as a result of land acquisition are resettled by appropriate government. We see scheduled areas which uh, uh, scheduled areas as defined in section 2 of the provision of panchayats extension to the scheduled uh, areas act of 1996. We also see small farmers being defined here. So, we saw some selective definitions from this act it is uh, liable to change time to time as per the prevalent state or central government law. This act made provision for preparation of social impact assessment study. Let us see uh, what does the social impact assessment uh, means SIA social impact assessment includes the process of analyzing, monitoring and managing the intended and unintended social consequences both positive and negative of plan interventions and any social changes its primary purpose, the primary purpose of this uh, assessment is to bring about a more sustainable and equitable biophysical and human environment. So, as per the act whenever the appropriate government intends to acquire land for public purpose it shall consult the concerned panchayat, municipality or municipal corporation whatever may be the case and carry out the social impact assessment in consultation with them in such a manner uh, which is prescribed by the government. As per the uh, act the social SIA the social impact assessment study will include assessment 
whether the proposed acquisition serves public purpose or not, um, estimation of the affected families, extent of land, public and private houses, settlements and other common properties which are affected, uh, whether the extent of land proposed of acquisition is the absolute bare minimum extent. So, we sh uh, one should not take too much of land, whether the land acquisition is an alternate place has been considered. So, alternatives have been considered or not, study of social impact of the project, nature and cost and so on. Further, we see appropriate government shall require the authority conducting social impact assessment study to prepare a social impact management plan also. So, if there is a positive or negative impact or negative impact in particular how that has been managed, so a management plan is also required. There would be public hearing for social impact assessment and particularly at the, at the affected area to ensure the views of the affected families have been recorded and included in the SIA report. Uh, as per the act, SIA needs to be published, the social impact assessment study report and the uh, social impact management plan are to be prepared and made available in the local language, not in English or any other language, but in the local language to the panchayat, municipality or municipal corporation. Moving on, we further see that one of the key feature of the act is uh, that it provides safeguard for food security. In order to ensure safeguard for food security, the act specifies that no irrigated multi-cropped land shall be acquired under this act. Such land may be acquired subject to the condition, there is a condition that it has been done under exceptional circumstances as a demonstrable last resort. So, uh, we may see that it lays uh, several uh, criteria under which the food security has to be ensured. Act states that uh, whenever multi crop irrigated land is acquired, the alternatives have to be given. Further, it instructs that in case not falling under subsection, so further we see that the act provides instructions on preparation of rehabilitation and resettlement scheme by the administrator. The collector, the administrator is required to conduct a survey and undertake a census of the affected families. It will record particulars of the land and immovable properties being acquired of each affected family for the purpose of rehabilitation and resettlement. Administrator shall also record livelihood lost. Uh, a, uh, administrator would also list public utilities, government buildings, it would also take care of the detailed amenities and infrastructure facility and also any common property resources which have been acquired. Uh, the draft rehabilitation and resettlement scheme shall include time limits for implementing rehabilitation and resettlement, so it should not go on and on, but it has to be time bound and it has to be made locally known by wide publicity. Public hearing shall be conducted and the administrator shall submit the draft scheme for rehabilitation and resettlement along with the specific report on the claims and objection raised in the public hearing. Further detailed procedure to be followed like there are uh, details given in the act uh, which some of them include approved rehabilitation and resettlement scheme to be made public and then it has to be published and so on. Uh, the act also specify the award, uh, award should be made within the period of 12 months from the date of publication and there might be some exceptions. Uh, if no award is made within that period, the entire proceedings for the acquisition of the land shall lapse. The act also provides formula to determine the market value of the land. Act also provides instruction on calculation to determine the amount of compensation. We also see there are parameters given for how to calculate the amount of compensation uh, depending on the market value and then the damages co uh, sustained by the people uh, as well as um, uh, any other consequences of acquisition and also based on the uh, any kind of loss of the profit uh, because of the acquisition any kind of loss to the profit of the land. So, based on these parameters given, um, the award of uh, the compensation is determined plus one also need to take care of the award of solar TM, 
compensatory fees which is given. So, this would be in addition to the compensation payable to the any affected person. Moving on, we look into the sum rehabilitation and resettlement award. As per the act, I am only listing few, you may look at the act for detailed understanding. Rehabilitation and resettlement award shall include uh, the following particulars of payment for the cattle shed and petty shops and so on, any detailed mandatory employment which has to be provided, particulars of any fishing rights, particulars of any entitlements and particular of special provision for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. The rehabilitation and settlement shall also include provision for infrastructure amenities in resettlement area which is one of the key provision of this. In every resettlement area the collector shall ensure the provision of all infrastructure facility and basic minimum amenities as specified. Affected persons shall also have the power to take possession of the land to be acquired. There is also provision for additional compensation in case of multiple displacements. Uh, there is special provision for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. As far as possible, no acquisition of land shall be made in scheduled areas. So, it should be um, proved that it is a last resort for why the land in the scheduled area is being taken. Further, we see that act make provision for reservation and other uh, benefits. So, all benefits including the reservation benefits available to scheduled tribe and scheduled caste in the affected area shall continue in the resettlement areas. Moving on we see that the act also makes provision and instructions on temporary occupation of waste or arable land. The act provides formula for compensation calculation as seen in the image. So, these are all the formats given for how the calculations have to be done. Looking at the main features of the right to fair compensation and transparency in the Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act of 2013, uh, we see that you have already, uh, already walked through the act, you see that it defines various uh, types of public purpose, further it makes provision for prior consent, uh, likewise it makes, uh, uh, proposes the payment of compensation. Uh, and there are uh, criteria for that as well as we see that uh, review indicates that this is the very first law that links Land Acquisition Act and the accompanying obligations for resettlement and rehabilitation. So, it brings rehabilitation, resettlement and rehabilitation. Uh, it also has provision for retrospective operation in order to address historical injustice, the bill applies ret retrospective witty two cases where no land acquisition award had been made earlier. Further, it also talks about share in the sale of acquired land uh, increase. Uh, it also talks about the income tax exemption. There is a strict restriction on the multi crop acquisition for the food security purpose. Further, we see that for the food security purpose, it also gives fishing rights and other thing. Uh, it also emphasizes the time bound social impact assessment and also the appraisal of social impact assessment. Looking at the limitation of the act, even this the researchers have reviewed this and the limitation include, uh, the researchers point out the act leads to delay because of this such a tedious process, it leads to delay. There is no binding recommendation of the expert group, so whatever recommendations they get, they can be ignored. Uh, there is a vague meaning, still there is a vague meaning to public purpose. We see that there is a lack of monitoring system and then still there is prob problem of poor implementation of the acts by the state. We uh, see that researchers also point out that uh, uh, regarding the determination of the market value is still a challenge and there is also challenge uh, lacunae in the temporary acquisition as well as prior consent. We further see that there has been dilution of the act soon after it was enacted on January 1st, 2014, the government diluted the act through the through an ordinance later in 2015. The reason was that the new act was cumbersome, time consuming and cost escalating making its implementation difficult. The ordinance also makes the process of acquisition simple. So, uh, we see that the states have modified the act, the states have found it difficult to acquire land for industries. So, states have tweaked the legislation to make land acquisition a quick and easy process. So, there are further uh, uh, 
discussion on the limitations of this act which has uh, which talks about reducing the notice period of public hearing and so on and uh, other conflict of interest. Uh, summarizing we discussed the issue of land, we looked at uh, we reviewed uh, government's need to acquire land, we defined concept of eminent domain, we looked into the uh, rights to property uh, as per our constitution, we looked into the history of land acquisition, we identified and reviewed key elements of the 2013 act. So, uh, that was what we covered today, the key references uh, we have listed here and there are all suggested reading here. That is all for today, thank you.